Welcome to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Bob Dancer is America's premier video poker writer and teacher. He's written 10 books, including Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner and the best-selling Million Dollar Video Poker. He helped develop the computer software Video Poker for Winners, and in 2004, he was inducted into the Video Poker Hall of Fame. Richard Munchkin has been a professional advantage player for over 30 years and is in the Blackjack Hall of Fame. His book, Gambling Wizards, Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers, is a testament to the many ways you can succeed at gambling. The goal of the show is that you'll be a more knowledgeable gambler tomorrow than you were yesterday. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Dr. Adam Kucharski, author of a new book called The Perfect Bet, How Science and Math Are Taking the Luck Out of Gambling. Adam Kucharski sorry, is a professor in mathematics, graduated from Cambridge University, and is currently a lecturer in mathematical modeling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Adam Kucharski, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Good morning. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Adam. It's nice to have you with us. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Adam's book today, and um, we, I guess we'll start with um, uh, lotto, uh, lotteries. Um, in the book, uh, and we've had on our show a, a gentleman named Mohan Srivastava, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, a uh, couple of times, who's found ways of beating the scratch-off tickets. Um, but in your in your book, you talked about a group of MIT students that found a way to exploit the lottery. Can you uh, can you tell us a little about that? Yes. So this uh, story started a few years ago with uh, a college project, as it happens. Um, as a student at MIT for his final year project, um, decided it'd be interesting to compare lotteries and see um, what kind of uh, odds or what kind of payouts players would have. And he started with the popular ones, things like Powerball and um, Mega Millions. Um, and then obviously the project started to grow a bit. And he looked at um, a game called Cash Winfall that had been introduced in Massachusetts um, a bit earlier. And Winfall was slightly different to the other lotteries. Um, in something like, like Powerball, obviously you can get these big um, rollovers occurring if you don't get any winners. And um, Massachusetts had actually had a problem with their lotteries of no winners for um, over a year on one of their games. So they wanted to tweak the game um, to make sure that that didn't happen um, again. And what they did is whenever the prize money got to two million, um, they introduced a roll down feature. So what that meant was um, if there was no one with, with the top tier um, guesses in that week, the prizes would roll down to the other prize tiers. Uh, and it doesn't take much to spot that this could potentially hand quite a big advantage to players because you don't have to match as many numbers. You could get um, a fair bit of prize money uh, with um, without matching so much. And the student, uh, James Harvey, and some of his um, fellow students calculated that there was basically about $2.30 uh, waiting in prize money for a $2 ticket uh, during these weeks. So really, you know, the, the amount of prize that was, that was out there was worth more than the cost of buying a ticket for these games. And they orchestrated these enormous number of ticket sales um, to actually capitalize on these roll-down weeks. Ah. So uh, their big coup, though, was making it go over when nobody else thought it was going to go over into the roll-on. They bought I, so many, so many, so many extra, and they had prepared for this for months that they could just flood the market and make it work and nobody else saw it coming. Yes, yeah, so as, as you mentioned, this was really uh, the way they carried out their analysis to, to the point where actually they were, they were you know, nudging the game into this situation because a number of other syndicates have started to get in on the action as well. Obviously, once word gets out um, that there's an advantage here, but as you mentioned, in one week, they actually bought up so many tickets that it nudged it over this two million threshold and a lot of the other syndicates i think were expecting something to come the week week after a week after that maybe but actually um by by tweaking the amount of tickets that have been sold and nudging up this um 
this prize fund, the, the MIT group actually got it to come early. And as a result, that week, they scooped all the prize. You know, when Mohan was on the show, he, he also mentioned this, this group in Massachusetts. And um, he had talked to uh, the lottery officials there. And um, they, uh, it was very interesting, their reaction, because their reaction was, first of all, oh, it's this Mohan guy that is a thorn in our side again. Uh, but also the reaction was he pointed out that 75% of the money being won was won by these groups of professionals. And the lotto's attitude was, well, we don't care. They're not doing anything illegal. So, you know, it's more ticket sales for us and and no problem. Yeah. And as, as you mentioned, there's there's nothing technically illegal about it. I mean, it doesn't actually in any particular week change someone's chances of winning you know if you play in a roll down week you've got the same chance with a ticket as anyone else but of course it does present this issue that essentially in the non roll down weeks those prizes are subsidizing the people who are coming in um, with the better method and scooping up the money I think this is probably one of the reasons that that particular lottery was phased out and I think often lotteries try and strike this balance between they want games that that appeal to players. But then on the other hand, if you have teams coming in and taking advantage, that doesn't do too well from a press point of view. All right. Let's move on to another subject. There are bots, basically computer program robots, so to speak, that these bots can beat the best chess players in the world and the best checker players in the world. Recently, a program has done well against one of the world's best Go players. Now, Limit Heads Up Texas Hold'em has essentially been solved by the Cepheus project. That was a few years ago. How close are we to finding a solution to No Limit Texas Hold'em? We're actually very far off. Um, the difference, although it might not seem like a lot, of, uh, of a limit um, heads up Hold'em um, and a No Limit is, is actually enormous. It, one of the ways we can measure how complex a game is is to look at what's uh, called the state space, so the possible arrangements uh, and uh, situations you could find yourself in during the game. Um, and if you rank the games in this way, then uh, Limit Hold'em is, is actually less complex than chess. Um, but No Limits Hold'em is far beyond even um, the complexity of a game like chess. So uh, I think it's, it's really in terms of finding this optimal strategy um, very far off indeed. Um, however, you don't necessarily need a perfect strategy to beat humans. Um, all of this kind of analysis is assuming that you're playing a perfect player. Uh, and in many cases, it looks like the best No Limits uh, Texas Hold'em bots are getting much closer to uh, how humans are performing. And you know, potentially, we're going to see it uh, overtaking in the next few years. So your whole um, kind of uh, thesis behind this bo book was to look at kind of a brief history of gambling and, and mathematicians learning about probability and then kind of looking at the acceleration of our knowledge once uh, computers came into play. And, and how, basically, how did, how did you get started on the project? What, what drew you to it? So I've got a mathematical background. Um, you know, that's what I did, did all my kind of training in. And I've always had an interest in games and betting. I think anyone who who kind of has a mathematical inclination, likes looking for loopholes, and you want to see optimal strategies and this sort of thing. And when I was a student, I remember with the growth of online betting, we were always looking for ways to, to exploit um, what was on offer and, and find an edge. And the more I started to look at the history of it, and the theory of gambling, the more I realized that actually, you know, you've got this relationship between mathematicians and scientists and, and betting and many of the ideas uh, that are very common in science um, and that you know, I use on a daily basis originated with gambling. And as you mentioned, as computers have, have developed, um, it's accelerated many aspects. And in, in many cases, science and, and technology are really um, helping push things forward a lot. And I think certainly from a game-playing point of view, um, the rise of artificial intelligence and the ability of bots to take on human players has been really interesting in the last few years. And that's what I wanted to capture in the book, that historical relationship and how that's evolved and where it's um, ended up being today. 
going back to where we were in the conversation a few minutes ago. <laughs> Before I so rudely interrupted. <laughs> no, I, um, it wasn't rude. It was a good question. I love your questions, but I, my own train of thought is often not where your train of thought is. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> the, uh, you're talking about the, building a bot to beat humans is different than building a bot to beat another bot. Now, there are what you called um, strong solutions and weak solutions and ultra-weak solutions. So what are those, and how does that discussion fade into what you were just talking about? Yes, so there's, when we talk about solving a game, there's actually a number of different things uh, we can mean. And, and generally, it means coming up with a strategy that um, is, is optimal. So even if you're playing a perfect opponent, it will get you. Um, the best possible result. And a strong solution is where uh, no matter which point of the game you come into, so even if the game is halfway through and people have made bis- mistakes and, and things have screwed up, you still know what the, the best possible set of, of moves is, the best possible strategy at that point. Um, often games are too complex to actually be able to do that. You might be able to do it for something like tic-tac-toe, but... I could do it with tic-tac-toe. I'm so smart. I think most people could, right? Yeah. Um, But something like even checkers, it's it's difficult to do that if you're midway through a game. But what you can, uh, in some cases, do is find a weak solution. So this is if two perfect players start right from the beginning of the game and play the optimal strategy all the way through. You know what that strategy is and you know what the result's going to be. So this is what a weak solution is. You just know from beginning to end um, what the optimal thing to do is. Um, Beyond that, there's also what's known as an ultra-weak solution. So this is where you know what the outcome of a game will be, but you don't necessarily know the strategy that will get you there. So an example of that would be games like Connect 4 where you have to put um, a certain number of things in a row. Actually... it, there's a, only a few steps of logic based on how these games work um, that can show that the player who goes second can never win those games. Um, and you don't necessarily know what the strategy is from those logical steps, but it's just by looking at, at how it's structured, you know what the outcome's uh, going to be. So yeah. those are the three types of solution um, we talk about when we mean solving a game. Well, the, you, the second player can win if he's playing my niece. She, she yeah. I could win easily against my niece. Um, but okay, that was, she is ultra, ultra weak, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Building bots to play poker and go and things, how is that the same or different than building bots to do well in financial markets? There's obviously a number of bots coming into these, um, these kind of situations, Poker bots are, are really very different. Um, often the focus of those is, is very careful decision making. So poker's a very complex game and bots generally will have spent a lot of time learning and refining their strategies. And in many cases, um, the bots are actually better than their creators. The, these bots you know, make very um, careful and refined decisions. In financial markets, often bots are employed um, solely for speed. So in many cases, the objective is you just want to get your trade away before someone else. Uh, and this means that often the, the algorithms that are trading um, are very simple. In some, some cases, there'll be a few lines of code. So they might have a reputation for these very complex computer software. But actually, in many cases, someone I interviewed for the book put it, you know, these things are, are less intelligent than insects. You know, you, you've got a few lines of code to do one thing very quickly. Uh, and this means that you don't have that kind of subtlety and nuance in the decision making that you might have with a poker bot. Now, um, you mentioned the guys uh, in the book, The Eudaimonic Pie, who uh, had built a roulette computer. And their project after that um, was called, I think, the, the, prediction, the Prediction Project or something like that, or the... Prediction company, yeah. The prediction company, right. And, and, and that was, what, 30 years ago or so, or that they were trying to build a, a black box to trade. And theirs wasn't built on speed, was it? It, it was actually trying to find winning bets? Um, exactly, yeah. So their idea was to um, essentially create um, what they called um, a learning, well, I think it was a learning automata. So it was, it was making these, trading decisions, but doing it based on available evidence um, automatically. 
Um, so, so Dern Farmer, who was one of the people who developed this method, compares it very much to an evolutionary process because when you um, spot uh, a gap in the market or you know you identify there's some kind of inconsistency uh, firstly you need to test whether it's really there whether it's actually something that um, can be exploited reliably and then you obviously need to develop uh, a strategy that can exploit it but then over time the market will catch up and that strategy might become um, less effective as other people either jump in on it or whatever the inefficiency is, disappears. So that was really their logic to how they developed these trading strategies. It was this evolving automated process that would try and identify bits of the, the market and inefficiencies that could be exploited and then adapt them over time um, as the nature of those inefficiencies changed. And were they ultimately successful? Um, they were, by all accounts. I mean, obviously, the, the details of these things are always uh, quite tightly under wraps. But um, I think between them, yeah, they did very well indeed. And are they, are they still doing that, or have they moved on to something else? They moved on to, to different projects. So, um, so Farmer, for instance, is now a, a professor at Oxford. So he still works on um, the, the sort of economics of markets and. One of the things um, that he's actually very interested in now is um, the relationship between uh, different agents in a market. So I think there's a lot of focus, um, particularly when it comes to financial maths, of single events and single trades. You want to know how to hedge your risk or how to look at um, specific transactions. But there's a much bigger question, I think people are asking it more and more now, of almost the systemic level um, interactions. If you have lots of people all trading together, and in many cases these very high-speed algorithms trading together, and they're all influencing each other and reacting to each other, I think there's a lot we don't understand about actually what can happen afterwards. In terms of stability of markets? Exactly, yes. So it's really looking at that, that overall uh, system and what that means in terms of stability rather than just focusing on the individual components. So it is possible that our, with all these bots that our markets are less stable and they're more likely to crash than they were when everybody was doing it by hand. Is that, is that a correct assumption? There's cer certainly more potential. And uh, I think we're seeing in, in recent years that if there is a problem, it's happening on a much faster time scale as well. Um, so well, it is a situation where the, the time scale of these things occurring is much quicker than humans uh, act on. That's something that I think we're going to have to uh, adapt to as these, these systems become more complex. Because although these um, financial bots are often following very simple instructions, there's a lot of nice biological theory actually from, from ecology that shows if you put together a lot of simple rules, you don't necessarily get simple behavior. <laughs> and we've had a number of examples of that, right? Where the market just went crazy for some periods of time. And like then, a half a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, and the, the, the timescales of these things are, are you know, amazing. There's, there's some of these things that we, even within a single second, um, you can get a, a runaway algorithm that you know, managed to lose money you know, dozens of times, even within that very short space. So if you put lots of these things together, all overreacting and, and almost like herd behavior, um, then very quickly you can see something change uh, you know, in a big way. Black swans. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to a different subject. You mentioned the MIT Sloan Sports Analytic Conference. Now, that's an annual event at MIT, go figure. And they uh, help mathematically understand various aspects of sports, many of which can be bet on. In this country, one of our most colorful b basketball commentators is a Hall of Fame player named Charles Barkley. Charles said... It wasn't scripted. It was off the top of his head. And, but he quoted, because they had no talent to be able to play, so smart guys wanted to fit in, so they made up the term analytics. Analytics don't work. That's Barkley. Now, for professional sports bettors, it's very likely that using analytics is useful, whether Charles Barkley agrees or not. Still, even though Barkley makes idiotic statements from time to time, He's not stupid. The knowledgeable observer can evaluate sports talent in ways that analytics cannot. Now, if you were consulting for a professional sports team, 
how much would you recommend they use analytics to make their decisions? I think analytics can always do something useful. And I think with the increasing availability of data, uh, there's going to be a growing need um, for analytics in sport. One of the, the real benefits it can do is take all this information and identify the key factors that are important um, for a particular result. And ultimately, that's what teams are interested in. They want to know why um, they get a victory and you know how they can add to those kind of features. Um, I think also analytics can be very objective. Um, often amongst commentators and pundits, there's dogma or kind of accepted wisdom about how sports work and what's are important that might not always have been tested properly. So that's one thing that analytics can do is actually remove that quite subjective argument and focus on, on what's really kind of measurable. Um, but there all are some drawbacks, of course. I think analytics you know, is a good starting point, but should never just be used alone. One of the issues is that there's certain parts of sport that are very difficult to measure. Um, an example might be um, things like defenders in soccer or cornerbacks uh, in football, which, if they're doing their job well, might actually not do many do actions that are, um, are measurable. So they might not make many tackles. It might be much more positioning and, and subtle features of their play. And obviously, this is very hard to quantify, and that might be something that you're missing um, from a particular model. And that's something that a knowledgeable observer could tell you a lot quicker than perhaps a particular model would. Um, from a sports performance point of view, another big issue is when teams recruit players, for instance, what they're essentially paying for is their future performance, but they've only got past data to go on. So things like um, psychological factors, which if a player is moving country or moving city, might be very hard to predict and stick in, a, in an analytic model, um, are something that experienced coaches um, could work from. And Pretty much all the, the successful bettors I talk to combine um, the two. So they, they have models and they have their, their computer predictions, but they always keep one eye on reality and, and one eye on what are they actually missing. You know, they don't assume that there's some magic formula that will tell them everything. They're aware that they may be capturing a lot with analytics, but there's always something where it's worth having that human insight as well. Well, sometimes also the, the particular, the coaches or the people in the sport won't pay attention to what the statistics tell them. Uh, like if you look at the movie <clears throat> Moneyball um, or, you know, more and more people are realizing that, that coaches in uh, NFL football just do things that are statistically wrong all the time, maybe because they're, um, you know, in fear for their jobs or something. But, you know, they, they have this attitude of it's always been done that way. And, and we know more than these you know, gearheads who, who and their analytics. And I just would like to say about Charles Barkley, um, you know, Damon Runyon famously said, the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet it. And uh, I would love to take Charles Barkley's action. You know, I mean, he can, he can uh, say all he wants about how, the, how analytics uh, doesn't work. And, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I'd love to, I'd love to book his action, so... Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, you know, nothing uh, hones your decision making like having some money on the line. And uh, you know, I think a lot of these these advantage players have shown that you know when you're placing you know money on big bets, if analytics get, gives you the edge, then that's what you need to pursue. Now we are in the United States. Are we're a month away, maybe, from the professional football draft. Now, I don't know that you have these in England, but the teams take turns picking players. Generally, they're just coming out of college, and they take turns, and they select corners, quarterbacks, whatever their positions are. If you were advising a GM, a general manager, on the draft, approximately what percentage would you base the picks on analytics, and what percentage would you base on human factors i think that's a great question um i think it's one that's, that's difficult to to pin down um to a specific value i think it will potentially depend a lot on the team a lot on the sport. um i've talked to people in the uk for instance who were initially focusing on betting and now moving more over to kind of the the sports management side and I think, as I was mentioning with the psychology and with the individuals within a team, um, there's still a lot we don't understand. So 
I think the human factor should still play um, a fairly substantial role. But I think that is something that we're going to see changing over the coming years with as analytics gets better at predicting these sort of things. As you mentioned, there's there's a lot of um, perhaps re- resistance to this taking over. So um, obviously that would have to be managed in the whole process. But I think analytics has a lot to contribute and hopefully we're going to see more of that occurring. Now, I would think that the... Um the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, the best handicappers would hate it because I would think the best handicappers already know much of what's being presented at this conference and that when it is presented at the conference, all of the leaders of sports and the bookies are learning what the best sports handicappers already know which makes the handicapping more difficult. Now, Richard is shaking his head on this. You probably can't see it over here <laughs> from England, but um, would that be, well, I would think the bookies or the betters well, would hate this. The, the, the Sloan Conference just happened two weeks ago. Um, I yeah. had friends there uh, who basically said there really was nothing there. I mean, they, they you know, probably will not go back. And uh, But also, I think um, those people... They, they don't listen. They don't learn. I mean, like, again, look at NFL where they don't go to f- go for the fourth down as often as they should. They don't go for the two-point conversion as often as they should. And I think it's very much like casinos where people go, oh, my God, somebody wrote a book. It's going to kill all the games. And, you know, they're not going to read a book. <laughs> you know, that would be like work, <laughs> you know. Um, so no, I, I I don't think uh, I don't think many big secrets come out at the Sloan Conference. I don't know. What do you think, Adam? Um, I I think you're right to to some extent about people often want an easy win, um, and I think you know the sort of people who would follow those things um, almost. I mean, talking to people who kind of experience with sports, they want something that, that validates their view of how things work. Um, and one of the things I, I really kind of discovered writing this book is just the, the phenomenal amount of effort the top gamblers have, have gone into. You know, it's not just about having some magic formula. It's about understanding the data, understanding the sport, and in many cases, being able to carry out the betting as well. So I think, although there might be some insights from um, some of these research conferences and similar things, um, I think the more you talk to the people in the industry, you realize that um, you know, this is something you've really got to be focusing, focused on. I think for many people, um, yeah, that's not something they're willing to do. But you'd think any the 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 best coach in American football by consensus w- would be Bill Belichick, who uh, for the Patriots. Uh, you would think him hiring a really smart football handicapper and telling him i will give you 500,000 a year to oh, they be pay much more than that <laughs> whatever whatever it is so to focus on what we're doing that would allow other teams to blah 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 against us i would think that would be a really small thing to pay and that the best coaches are probably willing to do that they are doing it they're doing it in baseball. They're actually, the, it's it, that's happening now in all in all the sports, um, but not all the coaches. But but the smart ones are doing that now, um, and I think it started with baseball because of uh, you know Bill James and sabermetrics and uh, Billy Bean and Billy Bean, yeah. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, no, that is that is happening somewhat. Um, so those guys are reading the books. Yes. Yeah. Are they having? Their underlings read the books and right. and, re- and summarize right. and stuff. Yeah. All right. So they're at the conference. They're at the MIT's conference, and presumably, of course, for Belichick, it's in his backyard. But uh, all right, let's move on. Bill Benter. We had him on this show a couple, uh, not so long ago, after he was inducted into the Blackjack Hall of Fame this year. and But he's a major featured player in your book. Tell us about what Bill Bencher did that was so remarkable. Wait, before you do, I just have to say, when I got your book and I started reading it and I went, holy shit, Bill, you know, Bill talked to this guy <laughs> for this book. And, and um, I was quite amazed 
and thought that quite a coup on your part because, you know, traditionally Bill has been very closed mouth. So how did you get him? And then and and then go on to what Bob asked you. Um, I mean, I I can't comment exactly on, on what made uh, Bill happy to talk to me. I think I mean I was I was very much interested in the science and and the statistics of what he was doing. Um, and I th- yeah, I think with with all the stories in the book, I don't just want to kind of look at the headlines. Uh, I really want to delve into the scientific thinking. And um, Bill obviously has a um, a mathematical background and started off in in blackjack um, and did pretty well in this but obviously you know as you become well known i'm sure you're aware um with card counting it becomes a lot harder as, as casinos start to, to ban you and then he started to move into um horse racing and handicapping as you mentioned and um one of the things actually as i was talking to him that he, he was very keen to emphasize was the the academic contribution of of other people so the research is almost the kind of standing on the shoulders of giants idea um, and it was two researchers, um, Ruth Bolton and Randy Chapman, um, which he noted in particular, who developed um, a lot of the theory for essentially how you take um, data on horse races and convert that into a measurement of how the quality of the horses, they called it, and then use that to make predictions um, about a particular race. And so that was a theoretical development. But what I think Bill really did um, that, was, that was central to kind of putting that into practice um, was firstly found a place where if you're going to essentially have an experiment to study horse racing, Hong Kong is the place to do it. Uh, in the US, you have a lot of races, a lot of different horses involved. Um, in Hong Kong, there's two tracks. There's about a 1,000 horses that race against each other repeatedly. So as almost a scientific experiment, it's a really good place to test out these particular methods. Um, But I think also, as well as just coming up with this model that works very well, um, one of the things that um, Bill and his colleagues also put a lot of effort into was actually the execution of these bets. Um, Because in those those kind of racetracks, you've got a power mutual market. So the odds on display depend on what everyone else is doing. So you have to really be quite clever about how you place your bets and when you time them. Um, Because potentially, if you've got a smart guy across the way, coming at the last minute and dumping a whole load of money, that's going to change the odds. So there's really um, almost this kind of game theory anticipating what other people do aspect to it where you've got to put your bets on the horse that you think you know, you're know you going to have the advantage um, putting money on, but also trying to anticipate where the action is and how you actually almost drip feed your bets in to, um, to make sure that it doesn't change the odds too much and give the game away. So I think it was really that conversion of of this theory and and building up into a model that was viable and working out how to execute it which was really his uh yeah very successful contribution to the field and he i know that he's done lecturing in in the universities in hong kong um has he said is he involved with some university there in england now uh to study suffolk in suffolk okay um yeah maybe southampton i think he has a link with yeah um I mean, he's. Um, I get the impression, obviously, working on a number of projects. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly, it's, it's fascinating talking about the theory. I think just the whole story of of how the the racing um, methods developed and where they started and, and where they are now is just really interesting to delve into the the science behind it. Interesting, and he also uh, he's actually supporting a lot of university projects where students are coming up with new ideas think he's uh, giving back in a way that's going to increase the knowledge base. I have a lot of admiration for Bill. Move on to a different subject. The Kelly Criterion. That was invented, if that's the right word, some 60 years ago in the mid-50s. Um, is that still the best way to size your bets, or has that been uh, surpassed by some other methodology? The Kelly criterion still seems to be um, used by a number of people. Um, so the, the basic idea for this, of course, is is this uh, managing your bankroll. If you have a certain advantage, how much do you put on it? And that really stood out for me talking to a number of these gamblers, that that's almost an equally big part of the um, the betting, as well as developing a method that can predict something. You obviously need to make sure that you don't bankrupt yourself in, uh, in taking advantage of it. Um, but one of the things is, in particular is, is whether you should 
bet exactly as the, as the formula tells you to, whether you should ad- adapt it um, based on, you know, for instance, in horse racing, some element of kind of caution if you think that maybe, you know, your advantage might not be clear or might change um, near the time of the race. But also the theory, the sort of the mathematics of it has been developed further in recent years. So the Kelly um, criterion applies to a single bet, which works very neatly if you've got one wager. But in many cases in sports betting, you might have several wagers outstanding at the same time and they might depend on each other to some extent. So there's still a lot of kind of theoretical work that needs to be done there in terms of understanding if you've got several bets on at the same time, how should you actually balance those um, to to maximise your chance of winning without um, you know, running down your bankroll too much. So that idea does seem to be uh, very important in gambling, but I think as bets become more complex and obviously faster with some of the bots available, um, there's some tweaks that need to be done to kind of make sure that people are still uh, on top of their bankroll. Well, there are also some practical considerations. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, as an issue is it would look weird to be betting, you know, a hundred and ninety-seven dollars or such, and and um, and you don't want to be resizing your bets every hand based on how your bankroll has changed. But the other issue is um, often on blackjack bankrolls, you'll have two, three, four players who are all out playing at the same time, and and you know you can be devastated if if four five players all go out and happen to have a big losing session on the same day, you know, without communication between them, uh, you know, you could vastly be over betting without realizing it and, and decimate your bankroll. So um, there are all kinds of kind of practical problems for Kelly betting. And most people, you know, pick some fraction of Kelly to bet, uh, you know, to deal with that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and uh, I think a lot of the successes in betting have been taking this often quite abstract theory, and then, as you mentioned, you're making it actually practical. And if something in reality isn't going to work or is going to cause you problems, then you obviously have to to tweak to make sure you can actually carry out these bets. Right, and for blackjack players, it's a little simpler um, because they don't have to factor in the variance as much, right? So, but. Uh, it's not as simple as betting, you know, the percentage of your bankroll as as your advantage. You have to factor in. So, if you were a video poker player, for example, and you're playing a game with high variance, that's different than just saying, "Oh, I have a one percent edge, so I can bet one percent of my bankroll." Generally speaking, in video poker, you have very fixed bet sizes. So, if you're it, if you're playing a single line game, a dollar player bets five dollars at a time or a two dollar player bets ten dollars at a time right. you d- can't bet six dollars and 76 cents right. and um a whole, another problem is a whole lot of the return it has to be estimated in video poker because the game itself is less than 100 percent return but you strongly expect to get mailers and promotions in the future based on your play. And that is, tip for the best players, more than enough to get them over 100%. So it's this estimate with a considerable amount of variance because um, sometimes your estimates don't work out. Huh. All right, let's go back to roulette. Uh, the eudaimonic pie, if I'm saying that right. I've never figured out how to say that word correctly. <laughs> Uh, the best roulette players saying it's the games are less beatable these days because the casinos have taken countermeasures by making the fret smaller or other things. But in the old days, if you were using computers, it still boggles the mind how you can use a computer to figure out roulette. Can you go over some of the things that you would have to do with that computer program? Yes. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable story. The, um, uh, initially, you know, Edward Thorpe, who, uh, who developed um, some of these kind of wearable computer technology, and then, as you mentioned, the Udemans who, who built on this. Um, and really, with any of these kind of uh, physics problems like roulettes, it's a matter of collecting enough information to be able to understand um, the trajectory. So, in the case of um, 
you know, a ball spinning around the table, you've got um, initially this kind of um, centripetal force keeping it on the edge, but then gravity kind of pulling it down um, in towards uh, the middle. And when the Udemans were, were gambling in, uh, in Nevada, um, what they needed to do was obtain enough measurements about speed. So, for instance, by having a reference point on the table and, and tracking how many times the ball went round, and then adjusting, in this case, you know, by computer, the calculations for things like air resistance, which would be f slowing the ball down, um, to estimate where it might land on the track. But in some cases, these measurements were very sensitive to uh, where they were actually placing the bets. They found at one point that if um, sort of the weather changed where they were betting, that could have an effect um, on the the air resistance. So if it was, um, yeah, I think they said at one point, you know, if, if it was foggy on a day, the ball would leave track slightly earlier and on one case um they actually found they discovered another better um a slightly larger guy was leaning on the table so they were calibrating their their predictions in one uh set of conditions and then as soon as that changed it was very hard to um to work out what happened but actually more recently so a few years ago um some research in hong kong did a kind of independent validation of of the method um, and they found that just by recording, so having a clicker, the sort of thing you could hide in a shoe, and then just solving um, the equations of motion, that you could potentially get about a 20% edge over the casino. You know, if you're just predicting the area of the wheel um, that you expect the ball to land in. So although the information is imperfect and you'd be kind of doing it by hand, or in this case, um, they hid the computer in a shoe, uh, there does seem to be enough information there on those early spins before the croupier stops you to work out where the ball might land. You know, I, I was uh, recently uh, at a party. I was talking to a, a professional gambler who was um, who brought up the idea of, you know, could you write an app for your phone that basically just took two photographs of the wheel, say, you know, a hundredth of a second apart, and... Uh, and be able to look at the distance the ball traveled and the distance the wheel traveled in that hundredth of a second and calculate a prediction just from that. Um, what do you think of that good, idea? Yeah, it's a good, I mean, good idea. The, so these, the, the Hong Kong researchers I mentioned, um, did set up a, they set up a high speed camera actually and, and took many measurements and presumably you, you, you might not be able to do it with two photographs, but you probably with a, a fairly small amount of information, um, you could get something that's obviously much more accurate than trying to keep track by hand. Um, and because obviously it's a smartphone, you know, that it would have the co computer power to do the necessary calculations. So I think it would be interesting seeing exactly how much information you need to test it. Obviously, getting away with it will be a whole other story. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's in Nevada. There's something called felony. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, in sports, in horse racing, apparently there are ways that you can have your computer phone the track and place your bets right at the magic moment where there's zero time remaining. Are there other sports that you can have your computer phone in your bets and uh, that gamblers can take advantage of somehow? Um, so there's a few cases. I mean, one, one of the examples is obviously the rise of online betting. Um, so in some cases, you can actually, um, with things like websites like Betfair, for instance, you can actually hook up your software to, to the back end of their server. So rather than having to kind of go through the browser page to place bets you can actually hook directly up um, the place bets automatically so this if you're using these, these kind of high speed approaches gives you a direct way of actually placing the bets um, on their particular exchange so I think that's one thing that's growing in some cases you get these high speed um, situations as well but I did find it interesting talking to, to some of the, the high stakes so soccer bettors so this is in Asia there's, there's a huge amount of money on these things and in many cases this is still done um, either by human on phone or just using kind of instant messaging software. So um, I think particularly on the very large bets that are placed before um, the market actually opens, um, it's still very much done by person. But obviously in things like 
horse racing or in play betting online where you need that that speed then um the ability to hook straight up to the bookmakers is a big advantage yeah the t- the top sports bettors now have bots that go out to many different betting sites and and bet the games you know basically hit all the games at the same time you know um so i know that 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 is happening that technology is happening i wanted to go back to uh horse racing for a second you were you were mentioning that um uh you know that hong kong was sort of the uh, perfect petri dish for um uh you know uh, for analyzing horse racing but um i know back uh, when bill first started there um uh, here here in the united states the the people who are betting horse racing have this big advantage that they're getting rebates from the from the racetracks so they're getting a percentage of their turnover back which makes the game a lot easier to beat cuz the the takeout at tracks is 20 25%. Has that changed in Hong Kong or are are people still beating horse racing in Hong Kong with no rebate? Um I'm not sure the exact details um as they stand now in Hong Kong. I mean, certainly talking to to Bill, I got the impression that it was a pretty competitive market in Hong Kong now. I think you know really uh, a lot of people, because of the setup there, have moved in. So I think even with the specific track take and this kind of thing, yeah, there's there's just a lot of other people competing with good models there. Um, as you mentioned, though, you know, with the rebates in the US and actually in in my, many other areas, so racetracks in places like Australia and South Africa, uh, I think computer betting has grown a lot. And obviously, if there's incentives to do that combined with um, better computer predictions. Yeah, there's no reason for teams to start looking elsewhere if Hong Kong's become a bit crowded in terms of the market. Yeah, what about um, you know, one of the, the rise of all of these computer programs have has led to enormous problems in terms of people cheating. Um, there've been a number of cheating scandals at chess and bridge and you know, Lots, lots of games now are, are have these problems. In, online poker. Uh, online poker. Yeah, I mean, in in chess, like you can't go to the bathroom without a minder there to watch you go to the bathroom uh, during a chess match. Um, so, uh, w- do you have any thoughts about that on on uh, how this can, like, the future of of sport, you know, and and how this uh, how this is going to affect it. I think it, we're almost, I mean, particularly with poker, um, at this, this transition point. You know, so, if, so years ago, um, I mean, when pe- people first started making this, these bots about a decade or so ago, um, they often just programmed them with rules they kind of put in specifically. So in other words, the bot was only as good as, as its creator. Uh, and in many cases in, in online poker, you know, these creators weren't very good at poker, so the bots weren't a big problem. But really in recent years, we've seen... Um, a lot of improvements to the point where I think many very good players um, are often using these bots as training tools. I mean, certainly many top chess players will use computer programs as a training um, as a training tool. And I think similarly for poker, um, some of these computer programs are coming up with tactics which humans never would have dreamt of, uh, which I think is a really quite interesting development. You can have these games which we've been playing for for decades. But actually, um, computers are still teaching us a few things, uh, and in many cases, behaving in quite seemingly human ways. Um, talking to some of the teams working on these these really top bots, they found that um, they'll do things like try and manipulate their opponents or feign aggression or things that we wouldn't really imagine a computer coming up with by itself. So I think, as well as being quite a useful training tool for people who play these games, the bots are also, I think, just producing some quite interesting behavioral insights into actually all these things that gamblers have been doing for ages. You know, is that something that's inherently human or is that just part of the optimal strategy and the computers are discovering it as well? I mean, do you, do you, I could, I could envision a future without gambling where all games are solved. So it would sort of become pointless, uh, you know, Oh, is a difference. I mean, video poker is a solved game, but, that's different yeah. whether or not yeah, humans are able to implement it. I was curious. This is not something covered in your book. Um, backgammon is a minor league gambling game, but there's still it attracts some very smart people. And the best, the first 
computer programs to solve backgammon were all written and created by backgammon professionals. And now the poker programs are being created by computer programmers, not by poker players. Is there a shift in this, or is it just that backgammon is so much easier, or do you have any comment on that? i just making this up off the top of my head. Um, I, I think that is, that's a really interesting question, this transition from um, early games you know, with some of the work on backgammon where you had people who were pretty good players building these these programs that could almost just do the extra step that they couldn't quite manage. Um, but I think because a lot of these poker games are just so complex that even if you're a really good player, just to get to that extra level um, that's required to, to come up with a solution or come up with a very good strategy um, is just almost kind of far beyond um, what's possible. And actually, even if you look back to kind of the early ideas about um, artificial intelligence and learning machines, um, Alan Turing, in one of his early papers, made this point of it doesn't make sense to try and build what he called a finished mind. So don't try and give something all the skills up front. It makes sense to build a child's mind and let it learn. And really, I think that's what we're seeing with a lot of these games now, that the skills required to make a good poker bot aren't necessarily being good at poker. It's really kind of understanding how you can help a computer learn and the sort of um, behaviors and steps that are required um, for an artificial intelligence program to learn from its mistakes and become you know, much better than anyone else. Thank you. We've been talking to Dr. Adam Kucharski. His book is called The Perfect Bet. How Science and Math Are Taking the Luck Out of Gambling. Both Richard and I read it. Both Richard and I enjoyed it. Um, we want to thank you, Dr. Kucharski. Thank you. Very good. All right. The We have sponsors. We are actually taping this show earlier than we're going to broadcast it. So we're not, at this point, don't know when you're going to be hearing this. Uh, so I can't talk about the the promotions that each of the casinos is going to be having. But our three sponsors are the South Point Casino, who has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. The Palms Casino, who has weekly drawings. And VideoPoker.com, which is the best place to practice lots of different games. Okay, you can get the show delivered to you automatically every week at iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or at my site, richardmunchkin.com, uh, to find an archive, archive of all the old shows, every episode ever done, go to bobdancer.com. Very good. Thank you, Adam Kucharski. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>